Hello, you little charmers. We're the Smiths. How do you do? They're the most important, intelligent, most idiosyncratically English and most sorely missed pop band of the 1980s. If you don't agree with that, you probably think they're the most miserable acts of the era, each to their own. It was 30 years ago this week that Hand in Glove hit the airwaves, announcing the arrival of four lads from Manchester who couldn't easily be placed in the pop pigeonholes of the day. The Smiths produced four studio albums in as many years, crammed with 16 hit singles. Their music made you laugh, cry and think, and they left an indelible mark on a generation before taking a bow in 1987, leaving behind an exquisite corpse of words, images and sounds. For me, growing up in Manchester in the 1980s, the Smiths were my band. Morrissey was my idol. There I am. Age 13, the budding reporter with him. The day I wangled an interview with Morrissey for my school newspaper. The Smiths came to mean so much more to me than your average pop group, and I wasn't alone. They were it. They were as big and as important as the Jam and the Sex Pistols and the Beatles. It was just something really refreshing, really new, really simple and beautiful. You try to pass on good things to your kids, and a good thing to pass on is the Smiths music and what they stood for. There's a lot of goff, romantic goff talked about rock and roll, but I do think that, you know, the Smiths were a life-changing band. It certainly changed my life. The Smiths were the product of a specific time and place. They formed in Manchester in 1982, when the post-punk generation was still facing no future as the Iron Lady advanced on the North's traditional industries. Unemployment tops three million for the first time since the 1930s. And if that wasn't bad enough, Eurovision was the hot ticket in Harrogate that spring. Against this dismal backdrop of hardship and crap pop music, for a lost generation, the Smiths arrived like an answered prayer. You've got to see them, for me anyway, in the context of the darkest point of like the long, dark night of the Northern Soul under Thatcher's kind of one woman social experiment to crush the North of England underfoot. That alienation of people in the North feeling that the establishment was against them, the government was against them, that was very, very pronounced. And then you hear that sound, that sparkling, iridescent guitar sound. And that voice, that operatic voice out of North. Punctured bicycle on a hillside, desolate. There's a way of saying to the world, here we are. It's hard to beat this charming man. first seen them on top of the pops. They were just so odd. Johnny Marr looked like this classic rock star. He had a big red semi-acoustic guitar and a turtleneck and I was like, wow. And he had a, the Brian Jones hairdo. Mm. Yet Morrissey just looked like something that had never been seen before, you know, with an earring aid and flowers hanging out of his back pocket. They just kind of exploded, didn't they? The Smiths emerged into this uncertain arena that was early 80s Britain like a fully formed gang and invited you to join, to enter another world, their world. And the invitation came directly from their gladioli-wielding leader. I feel the Smiths create their world and not many groups do that. And you can either go in or you can say, no, I want Diana Ross instead. And it's your choice. Here was no ordinary alpha male rock frontman. Morrissey fearlessly broke the mould 
and was a beacon to all those struggling to fit into the existing 80s stereotypes, like market trader and aspiring fashion designer, Lancashire lad, Wayne Hemingway. Thirty years ago, Camden Market, you were here with your first stall. Yeah, the first stall was just over there in the corner. Uh, it was a place where, you know, all, all the club culture from all around the UK and Europe would come here to buy their old DMs, to buy their second-hand long coats, to buy their national health specs. Uh, the whole thing of, of, of the Morrissey look. This was the first time where the idea that you could wear your dad's and your mum's or your grandma's clothes uh, and, and mix it with a bit of new and mix all these different decades and come up with something that was different. Who did that speak to at the time? Who, who did that allow to kind of come into the tribe? Whatever persuasion you were, you know, if, if you were gay, you could like the way that he unbuttoned his shirt and the gladioli. If, if you were a bit hard, you could, you could like the quiff. But it all kind of crossed and he knew what he was doing. It was how he put it together. And that's the whole secret of cool, is how you take these things and you put it together. They may have been down with the underground, but Morrissey's effortless ascent to pop idol status also won the hearts of mainstream kids in Britain. But unlike other chart pinups, Morrissey was also after their minds. In Marsden, North Yorkshire, it was the words rather than the image that captured the imagination of Simon Armitage. The moment I start listening to them, I'm transported back to, you know, 83, 84. Did it speak to you and where you were in, in your life at that time? It absolutely did. I mean, I don't think I realised it then, um, but, you know, it, it, it was the language. And uh, I remember listening to Reel Around the Fountain, not quite sure what it was about, but thinking, nobody else is this smart. It's time the tale was told of how you took a child. such a peculiar song. It starts with a, a, a confession, almost an allegation, you know, it's time the tale were told. But then it develops into this slightly subversive celebration of, you know, sexual awakening and a loss of innocence. Fifteen minutes with you Well, I wouldn't say no And it's like a lot of the great Smith songs, it's a fantasy, and it never actually happened. It's all about imagining what something would have been like. And on that level, it's hugely appealing to anybody who's ever felt any kind of loneliness or, you know, that they're on the margin somewhere. The Smiths gave you a sense of, you're not on your own. Well, it, it was like they were saying, um, you are on your own, but there's a lot of you out there. A song like Cemetery Gates, in the hands of another band, would be a terrible, sort of morbid piece of work. Um, what you get instead is two specky intellectuals, you know, uh, trying to outquote each other. I've read well and I've heard them said a hundred times, maybe less, maybe more. It's the opposite of what you would expect from somebody of that age, you know, in, in a cemetery writing a song. Morrissey's songs were packed with hidden meaning for fans to discover and debate, as his fantasy worlds collided with the very real world around him in post-industrial Manchester. Park the car at the side of the road You should know Time's tide will smother you The North figured large in these songs. You know, they're, they're shot through with a sort of Manchester melodrama. These were lyrics just full of the details of everyday domestic life. When you walk without heat Smiths joined a long tradition of British literature, theatre and film 
that can be described as northern realism and is epitomised by the British New Wave cinema of the 50s and 60s. Morrissey particularly was clearly uh, really immersed in that kitchen sink drama, British New Wave, those black and white movies like um, Billy Lyre and Saturday Night and Sunday Morning and, and particularly A Taste of Honey. A Taste of Honey was first performed in 1958 and written by Salford playwright Sheila Delaney when she was just 18 years old. The film adaptation, starring Rita Tushingham, brought Delaney national recognition and won a raft of awards. Delaney's treatment of issues like race, gender and homosexuality, and simply her depiction of working-class northerners, was radical at the time. Dream of it. Dreamt of you last night. Fell out of bed twice. ta -ra. Morrissey's admiration for Sheila Delaney bordered on the obsessive. In way of tributes, he condensed the entire story of A Taste of Honey into the song, This Night Has Opened My Eyes. In a river, the colour of land Immerse the baby's head Wrap her up in the news of the world Dump her on a doorstep, girl I became very interested in film about people in the north specifically, with their tail trapped in the door almost, trying to get out, trying to get on, trying to be somebody, trying to be seen. And I found that very appealing. The Smiths' identification with the grit of northern life gave them a harder, darker edge than their chart contemporaries, and regardless of where their songs turn up today, on movie soundtracks and even wedding vows, they'll forever be anchored in those Salford streets. They came from these streets and they sounded like it. They talked about you know, the bleakness of it and the lack of opportunity sometimes and the miserableness of it. Yeah. But they also talked about the joy and, you know, and things. They, they made it beautiful, this place. This bleakly beautiful atmosphere infused all aspects of the Smiths. And it was visualised in their distinctive single and album covers, featuring images hand-picked by Morrissey himself. Joe Slee works at Rough Trade Records and oversaw the design process. Basically, well, I would receive something like this. Um, so it's effectively a very full diagram with notations of every single thing that he wanted, including uh, the Pantone colours and the typeface and whether it was bold or italic. Is this normal for a, a band to send in this level of detail? Not in my experience. No. Morrissey had a kind of artistic vision that was really unique to him. The band themselves never appeared in their artwork. Taking the plate of the standard group shot was a procession of moody photographic portraits. Bound together by their grainy duotoned colours and minimal use of text, the gallery of famous and not so famous faces and the odd bum, were an intimate scrapbook of pinups Morrissey wanted to share with the world. The cover stars seem to fall into, into two camps. You have the kind of tough northern female sort of <laughs> uber Coronation Street characters. Tell you? Can you tell me? What, what, what does it tell you? Um, he had a fantasy of what northern realism was about and the real loving background that, that they portrayed but I always had the feeling that he somehow hadn't had that. Mm. So there's a kind of nostalgia for something that perhaps was never really there. Oh, mother, I can feel the and with the male icons. You can say homoerotic if you want to, but for me there was more to it than that. And as I climb into an empty bed it was about perhaps a representative of who he longed to be, what was in his heart, really. Mm. And that's another thing that makes them beautiful, I think, is that they're all about what Morrissey used to call his unusable heart. <laughs> Morrissey used the power of the visual image to send coded messages to the outside world. 
However, when it came to burning issues that were close to his unusable heart, he was happy to resort to a more direct approach. Meet his murder. It's a very direct political message. And I was already a vegetarian by the time that came out. But, you know, it converted a huge number of people to yes. vegetarianism. Certainly that so. way for 10 years. This beautiful creature must die. A death for no reason, death for no reason is murder. We feel that um, popular music should be used in order to make serious statements because um, so many groups sell masses and masses of records and don't raise people's level of consciousness in any direction, and we find that quite sinful. What the Smiths brought was, was politics that you could actually completely understand. Meat is murder, anti-cruelty, anti-Thatcher. It was just a brilliant approach to, to politics, really. If the Smiths were anti-anything, it was the entire British establishment, particularly the royal family and Thatcher's government. The 1986 album and its title song, The Queen Is Dead, was their State of the Nation address. The Queen is Dead. I think musically it's one of the most powerful songs and it's got a real sort of anger bubbling below the surface. For a certain section of people, a certain generation of people, that, that did have a real impact. Few bands since the Smiths have so openly attacked the state and their oppositional stance is still used as a stick to bash the powers that be, even if those powers profess to be fans themselves. As someone who claims to be an av avid fan of the Smiths, the Prime Minister will no doubt be rather upset this week to hear that both Morrissey and Johnny Marr have banned him from liking them. Oh. <laughs> David Cameron purports to be a Smiths fan, but I'm very sceptical that he actually ever was. The Smiths are, of course, the archetypal student band. If he wins tomorrow night's vote, what songs does he think students will be listening to? Miserable Lie, I Don't Owe You Anything, or Heaven Knows I'm Miserable Now? I, um, I expect that I've, if I turned up, I probably wouldn't get this charming man. Um, and if I went with the Foreign Secretary, it'd probably be William, it was really nothing. <laughs> are you saying that you can't be right-wing like the Smiths? I think maybe some people just don't listen to the lyrics. You know, it's like there's a lot of Tories that like Eton Rifles and don't seem to realise that it's not, yeah. you know, their school theme song. The Smiths will always be remembered for courting controversy, but for many fans, Morrissey's political posturing and even his literary lyrics were mere dressing for the real art being produced by the band. My love of most things musical is strictly for the music. The shit going on around it, that's irrelevant. To me. Morrissey was going on about poetry and vegetarianism and, you know, Johnny was going on about the Rolling Stones and T-Rex and the Stooges and I was like, hmm, yeah. Each Where does Johnny Marr's guitar playing rank for you? I've seen him in the studio do things that are so simple on a guitar, yet so difficult at the same time, that does your head in, do you know what I mean? How hard is it to, to play like Johnny Marr? It's impossible, you can't. You know, if you're making a record and the producer's saying, try, try some of that Johnny Marr stuff, you better get on the phone and get him, because you can't, you can't do it. That's not him now, by the way. He invented a style which I'd never heard before. It's a true original. Johnny Marr's riffs are thing of legend in British indie rock, but to credit him as simply a jangly guitar hero would be faint praise indeed. Marr is without doubt the absolute gel that binds each track together. He somehow uses the guitar like an orchestrator uses an orchestra. Classical conductor Charles Hazelwood was still a school choir boy 
when he recognised the sophistication in the Smiths' arrangements. So let's say you've got, you know, a strum semi-acoustic guitar, which definitely is a kind of binding agent. And then elements of lead just coming in and out, little bits of phrase picked out, the odd note, maybe a chord here and there, kind of shafts of different kinds of light being just exposed to the whole, just to add extra elements or qualities to point something up. It's a really, really brilliant and rare talent. Morrissey and Marr were more Elton and Bernie than Lennon and McCartney in the way they wrote. Marr producing cassette tapes of musical arrangements for Morrissey to overlay his freeform vocal melodies. Whether they knew it or not, the resulting sound tapped deep into our national psyche. We're a melancholy race, we're quietly glum, but we're sort of quietly accepting. We've never had a revolution, after all. There's a kind of key element, I think, to the Smith's kind of musical or harmonic or melodic style, which I think sums this up. Basically, that's a consonant chord, a basic chord in root position. Now, there's an extra note you can add to it, which is that, which is a seventh. Now, either in its pure form like that or flattened, it's right at the heart of the blues. You know, it's the single most important kind of blue note mm. in the blues. And it, 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 it's sort of completely redolent of longing, of a sense of some sort of dissatisfaction, which um, you don't find in a lot of other, you know, guitar-based songs. I mean, the Beatles were much less full of these kinds of chords than the Smiths. The history of pop is littered with sad songs, but few acts have been able to capture this emotion and turn it into an arena-filling anthem quite like the Smiths. I wondered how many times people have either taped or burnt or downloaded or written out you know the lyrics to that song and sent it to somebody else it's it's just a, a beautiful brilliant all-purpose pro forma love song the core kind of anthemic quality that comes in the chorus the double decker bus thing it's that moment when you've been all these kind of slightly murky chords yeah With a little bit of dirt in them, and then uh, you get that little break. Suddenly, it's kind of like lovely primary color, like a you know, it's just a lovely phrase. Of course, people are going to wrap their lungs around that. And we're all pulled together in this kind of, you know, this wonderful sense of mass sort of communal indulgence. Halfway through this, you know, 6,000 people singing it. You think, you're thinking, essentially, this is a song about death. And yet, because it's the Smiths, it's got a kind of spring in its step. You know, it's E major. Oh. That's a nice, bright, open key. Yeah. If you're going to get killed by a 10-ton truck, it, you want it in E major, I suppose. I think you probably do, and you to know. sing along with it. I'd like an afternoon in a hotel with some cream tea and you playing this in the corner. <laughs> and it's going to be raining outside. We probably need to be in Manchester as well. <laughs> The universal appeal of the Smiths' hits travelled way beyond Manchester's city limits, as a fervent following spread amongst angst-ridden teens across the world. In the States, a gun-toting fan once attempted to hijack Colorado's airwaves in a bid to have back-to-back -back Smiths records replace the standard Top 40 fare. He didn't actually make it past reception at KRXY Radio in Denver, but the incident passed into legend. And there are battalions of other like-minded, but thankfully unarmed high school kids across the pond 
whose lives have been saved by this perversely exotic group from Manchester, England. I grew up in the sort of Bermuda Triangle where Bruce Springsteen meets Don Bon Jovi, a culture where, you know, you expect it to be a winner and, and sort of be on the cheerleading team and sort of be perfect and blonde and perky. And the Smiths were saying, you know, it's all right to be a bit of a nerd and wear spectacles and not have a, have a date and sort of be on your own. They created a club of outsiders and I felt like part of that club, even 3,000 odd miles away. This world of Wally Range and, and Rush Home and 60s film references, did it resonate with you? Did, did you have any idea what this world was? Oh, I was desperate to decode everything. So yes, I had to go away and find out what Tizer was and where Newport Pagnell was and, you know, Rush Home. And, but all these things were really romantic and, and quite glamorous. I mean, I just thought if I can just get to Manchester, then all of my prayers will be answered. Well, Amy did finally make it to Manchester and settled in London, where she's now the ringleader of a new generation of obsessive Smiths fans. She's written a stage play devoted to Morrissey, and every now and then she rounds up her fellow aficionados at events like Smiths Fest at London's Institute of Contemporary Arts to worship and celebrate their band. Good evening, apostles, and welcome to Smiths Fest at the ICA. Morrissey's cleaner! This is inside Smith's West, a very bizarre gathering of people. You can have your photograph mocked up outside a Salford Lads Club or your quiff resurrected. Hi. Hi. All right, let's give it a go. <laughs> 20 years since I last had a quiff. How's it look? Hardly Salford Lads Club, but the Smiths are going to be imitated, analysed and celebrated in there until the small hours. If quiffing your hair up and dressing up like Morrissey isn't your bag, we can all celebrate that it was 30 years ago this weekend that the Smiths invited us into their achingly beautiful, melancholic, oppositional world. It's a light which will never go out. Sing me to sleep, sing me to sleep. I'm tired and I, I want to go to bed. Like all the great bands, it's not something that you can sum up in one nifty sentence and say it's because of that. It's impossible. So people like you spend 30 years trying and they probably take another 30 years. We still come back to the same thing, they were just fucking great. Sing to me, I don't want to wake up on my own anymore. Don't there isn't a room for the Libertines like this anywhere in the world, is there? There isn't a room for Spandau Ballet anywhere in the world like this. I mean, there is, a, it, whatever you think of it, it gives you an idea of just what they meant to us. I mean, I was going to say them, but us. Deep in the cell of my heart, I really want to go. It's easy to sort of go, oh, this is a bit silly, but this is an expression of people's love for them, you know you, what I mean? You and I both know when we leave here, we can have a photo taken on that. Right, so that's, that's it, just the... Uh... Oh, 